Tantor Audio, a division of recorded books, presents Comparative Literature, a very short introduction, by Ben Hutchinson, narrated by Chris MacDonnell. Chapter 1 Metaphors of Reading Reading into Literature, The Rorschach Test What do you see in an ink blot? Some see an abstract cloud, others discern a menacing mask. Some see the suggestive spaces, others focus on the lines that shape them. We can presumably all agree that some ink blots are symmetrical, but beyond that, our brains process the information differently, projecting associations and prejudices and hopes and fears onto a shifting, undefined object. The image, in other words, is only as revealing as the observer. Impressionistic as it is, Hermann Rorschach's inkblot test offers an instructive analogy for comparative literature. Understood as the reciprocal study of at least two forms of writing, comparative literature is both the most natural and the most constructed of intellectual activities. As we struggle to make sense out of one text or tradition, we instinctively compare it to another text or tradition. One side of the object mirrors and shapes the other. Cover half of the image and it quickly loses any form of structure. Yet we also bring a whole set of political, historical and cultural predispositions to the comparison, a perceptual apparatus through which we conjure meaning as we compare it. To use one text to understand another, to read Shakespeare's The Tempest alongside Montaigne's essay On Cannibals, for instance, or to compare Chinese poetry of the Tang Dynasty with European poetry of the Modernist period, is to reveal something about one's own tastes and knowledge, if only the belief that there is something meaningful to be learned through contextualizing one's own tastes and knowledge. Comparison clarifies through its very methodology that reading literature is also reading into literature. For literature exists, after all, comparatively. From the dramas of antiquity to the novels of modernity, from Eastern epics to Western classics, there is not a text in history that is truly self-sufficient. To read and to write is to work within an existing framework of characters, conventions, plots and premises. How we understand one work of literature is contingent on how we understand another work of literature. The more we know, the more we contextualize. The more we learn, the more we compare. Knowledge itself is comparative. Beyond how we read, beyond how we write, Comparison is hardwired into the very ways that we think. While this makes comparative literature among the most ambitious of intellectual disciplines, it also brings the whole undertaking into question. For if to read is to compare, in the pithy words of George Steiner, one of the most influential of contemporary comparatists, then fencing off a protected zone for its pursuit might, in fact, seem unnecessary, since we are constantly doing it anyway. What, to put it simply, is the force of comparative literature as opposed to that of literature? To answer this question requires delving into the practice, the history, and the theory of the discipline. Why, and indeed how, does one become a comparatist? In my case it began with a passion for languages then for the literatures written in them, and then for how to join the dots between them. The moment the dots start to cohere into a pattern is the moment at which literature becomes truly comparative, and it is among the most exhilarating of intellectual experiences. To follow the evolution of the novel from Cervantes to Calvino, to study the history of the sonnet from Petrarch to Pushkin, is to navigate by new and larger constellations, drawn on by the delight of making cross-cultural connections. Anyone naturally inquisitive, 
whether with or without foreign language skills, can share this satisfaction. Curiosity, open-mindedness, intellectual ambition, these are the only prerequisites for making comparisons. For there are few more fundamentally human instincts than the urge to compare. From the earliest inklings of self-consciousness, we tacitly understand ourselves in relation to others. As we grow older, we learn to gauge our development through constant reference to peers, developing finely tuned antennae for similarity and difference. Comparison can take many forms. Empathy, envy, defensiveness, deference. But it always comes back to the perception of multiplicity, to the acknowledgement, whether grudging or grateful, that there is more than one way of being and more than one way of doing things. Looking beyond ourselves is how we learn. Scholarly modes of comparison take this basic psychological drive and dignify it with disinterest. Yet the context of the observer continues to provide the crucial point of reference. Comparative literature may aspire to the objectivity of a discipline, but in reality it is deeply complicit in the prejudices and positions that define it. Counterintuitive though it may be to admit it in the opening pages of an introduction, there is in fact no such thing as a single, objective sense of comparative literature. However problematic the idea of literature may be, and we will see that it is increasingly contested, the adjective comparative indicates nothing so much as complete disagreement on how to approach it. Almost every comparatist has a different idea of how and what to compare. Almost every comparatist has a different set of priorities. The only consensus is on the inherent instability of the term. Like governments in a democracy, we have the modes of comparison that we deserve. This instability is the very essence of comparative literature. Both its meaning and its methodology depend on unsettling fixed canons, on forging fresh connections, and mutually enriching links between disparate texts and traditions. Concepts such as world literature or multilingualism are merely the latest examples of the ongoing attempt to confer stability on an inherently unstable concept. Unlike the clearly demarcated fields of national literatures, English, French, Russian, etc., comparative literature does not have a canon of texts so much as a canon of approaches to texts. Comparative literature, in short, constitutes an indiscipline, a self-reflexive mode of reading rather than an object of study, or perhaps a self-reflexive mode of reading in search of an object of study. If this makes it akin to a Rorschach test, it also makes it a mirror for modernity's intellectual anxieties regarding globalization. International Relations But what is comparative literature? All comparatists will have heard this question at some point, if not at several, in the course of their working lives. Ambitious readers looking to stretch themselves are generally intrigued by the concept, but uncertain of its implications, and rightly so, in many ways. Even the professionals cannot agree on a single term, calling it, to take just three examples, compared in French, Literature comparée, comparing in German, Vergleichen der Literaturwissenschaft, and comparative in English. Where the French past participle suggests that the comparing has already happened, and the German present participle that it is in the process of happening, the English adjective blurs the distinction between object and observer. Is it literature that is comparative, or the approach to it? The very term itself, when considered comparatively, opens up a Pandora's box of cultural differences. Yet this, in a nutshell, is the whole point.
To look at literature comparatively is to realize just how much can be learned by looking over the horizon of one's own tradition. It is to discover more not only about other literatures, but also about one's own. And it is to participate in the great utopian dream of understanding the way cultures interact. In an age that is paradoxically defined by migration and border crossing on the one hand, and by a retreat into monolingualism and monoculturalism on the other, the cross-cultural agenda of comparative literature has become increasingly central to the future of the humanities. We are all, in fact, comparatists, constantly making connections across languages, cultures, and genres as we read. The question is whether we realize it. The aim of this very short introduction is to render this comparative impulse conscious. From the point of view both of scholarship and of cultural history more generally, the book will consider the theory and the practice of comparative literature as expressions of changing intellectual climates, as well as of the colourful cast of exiles, émigrés and explorers that has peopled these climates. The history and theory of comparative literature are the history and theory of how literary cultures have learned to view each other, of the understandings, misunderstandings, and privileged friendships that have emerged between differing modes of expression. The forces of modernity that gave rise to the discipline, from colonialism and nationalism to exile and internationalism, are also the forces that shaped it, sculpting its project of analogy, antithesis, and cultural differentiation. Comparative literature, in short, constitutes something like the international relations of culture. If such an understanding of comparative literature suggests that it is as much a political activity as it is a literary critical one, it also points towards the changing ways in which it has been conceptualized. The history of comparative literature is not just the history of a discipline, it is also the history of the self-understanding of the discipline. Two categories have dominated this self-understanding, modernity and Europe. This book duly traces the constitution of comparative literature in these terms. To do otherwise would be to distort the evolution of the discipline. But a counter-narrative could equally be constructed about pre-modernity in the world. As global historians are increasingly showing, there is no need to await the arrival of European modernity, and indeed, of the very idea of European modernity, to assert the possibility of a comparative perspective. Long before the Renaissance, languages such as Sanskrit, Arabic and Chinese rivaled Greek and Latin as cosmopolitan, supranational modes of expression. Multilingualism, between the vernacular and the lingua franca, for instance, was common in the Middle Ages. Comparative literature in this sense is also the interlinguistic relations of culture. Within modern Europe, the development of comparative literature as a process of intellectual exchange between nations looks back, in geopolitical terms, to the post-1648 idea of national sovereignty enshrined in the Treaty of Westphalia. To be international, first one has to be national. The principle of the balance of power, along with that of religious and by extension cultural freedom, ensured that the various empires and dominions began to pursue intercultural exchange in lieu of international war. By the 19th century, the era in which comparative literature would develop in earnest, this balance of power was reasserted, following the upheaval of the Napoleonic Wars, by the Congress of Vienna in 1815, which fixed the European map for the next hundred years. The fact that the major empires, Prussia, Russia, Austria, had made major gains meant that numerous smaller states and languages were now subsumed within their purview.
A range of differing cultures were housed within a handful of overarching groupings, the better to balance each other out at the supranational level. The conditions for comparison, one might say, were perfect. Yet for the emerging discipline of comparative literature, this imperial structure created a double bind, since it meant that attempts to overcome national divisions were tied precisely to those divisions, locked into a narrative of competing countries and colonies. Comparison developed, in short, within and between nations and empires. The Napoleonic, the Victorian, the Habsburg, as much as within and between languages and literatures. Understood in the geopolitical terms of the 19th century, comparative literature was also competitive literature. Compare and Contrast Given such competing narratives, how can the process of comparing best be understood? Perhaps we might usefully begin by viewing it as the search for a master metaphor. The Belgian-born critic Paul de Mont, 1919-83, argued that modern literature constructs its own allegories of reading. Comparative literature, by extension, constructs metaphors of reading, models of how to interpret texts and cultures between languages and nations. Such metaphors may provisionally be broken down into two groups, those indicating connection or similarity and those indicating disconnection or difference. Beginning with the former group, perhaps the most obvious metaphor for the comparative approach to literature is that of the crossroads. Standing at the centre of any number of converging routes or spaces, the Silk Road, the Holy Roman Empire, the Republic of Letters, the comparatist following this model surveys and directs the passing traffic. Such a position confers numerous advantages, privileged access to a range of sources, exposure to competing perspectives, constant stimulation and renegotiation. But it also risks being disorienting placing the comparatist at the mercy of chance and circumstance, her head spinning furiously like the roadrunner in one of those cartoons where the traffic signs are all flipped around. More fundamentally, it also depends on a model of comparative literature that is not so much Eurocentric, the great fear of contemporary criticism in an age of post-colonial globalization, as centric-centric since it implies that the comparatist must be at the centre of such debates as there are. In an age of global south and realigned peripheries, it is far from clear that such a centre can hold. An alternative, increasingly important model of negotiation is that of the marketplace. In an age in which successful authors write as much for an international as for a national audience, the cross-cultural marketability of literature has become a significant criterion in determining what gets compared and what gets written. The metaphor of the marketplace, that is to say, relates both to reader and to writer. Comparative literature is all too often understood solely from the critical perspective as a question of reception, yet it can also be seen from the authorial perspective as an issue of creation. Already in the 1820s, Goethe, in launching the term world literature, used the metaphor of the marketplace. Partly in the Enlightenment sense of a forum for trade and commerce, partly in order to encourage the dissemination of his own works. With one eye on possible foreign rights and editions, the author writes himself into the international marketplace of ideas just as much as the critic buys and sells these ideas. Comparison requires having something to compare. Monetized in this way, the metaphor of the marketplace points towards the socio-cultural framework in which comparative literature necessarily operates. 
towards the network of publishers, reviewers, translators and professors who make it possible. Metaphors such as crossroads and marketplace, as well as other, more overtly political, variations such as Parliament or United Nations, can be thought of as facilitating interaction between two or more perspectives. Indeed, one might go further and suggest that they mimic the very meaning of metaphor, just as the process of comparison functions as a simile, by saying that one thing is like another, so too it acts as a metaphor, from the Greek metaphorin, to carry over or transfer, indicating as it does the ways in which we compare one idea to another. In the words of one of the earliest thinkers of the Western tradition, a good metaphor implies an intuitive perception of the similarity in dissimilars. Aristotle's definition of genius might equally be applied to the way that comparatists approach literature, creating previously unsuspected links between two or more texts. Yet metaphors can be misleading. Sometimes meaning is not so much carried over as intercepted. The Danish critic Georg Brandes, 1842-1927, described comparative literature as a telescope that both magnifies and reduces, since it sees further, e.g. across the whole of European modernism, by focusing on specific objects, e.g., Texts by Ibsen, Strindberg, or Nietzsche, and his image neatly captures the ambivalent nature both of comparison and of its attendant metaphors. How are we to understand those metaphors that call into question any easy sense of comparative literature as simply an intellectual import export business? How are we to understand the mechanisms of difference as well as of similarity? What, in short, of what one might term contrastive literature? Contrastive literature forms the necessary counterpart to comparative literature. Without difference, no similarity. In order to say that one thing is like another, one must implicitly say what it is not like. To compare presupposes the ability to contrast. Seen in this way, comparative literature is as much about reconfiguring comparisons as making them, and accordingly it attracts a corresponding group of metaphors centred on the creation of new perspectives and meanings. Perhaps the most prominent metaphor in this group is that of the melting pot. Unlike the image of the crossroads, which suggests that texts and ideas may take different directions, but will still keep moving in some previously recognizable form, the linguistic melting pot, in pre-modernity Latin or Sanskrit, in post-modernity world literature in English or French, implies that local ideas undergo a fundamental change of form in order to find expression within the many variations of one global recipient. Understood literally, this would imply that comparative literature reduces all writing to a single mould, out of which then emerges a range of new, reconstituted meanings. Of course, comparison, even within one language, is not this straightforward. A single pot can contain a multitude of ingredients, ingredients that it is the role of the comparatist to taste and identify. Locating the border between one version of an idea and another, bringing them together, but also keeping them apart, is an essential aspect of comparative practice. If the model of the melting pot dissolves conflicting elements as much as it solves them, the idea of comparative literature as a border control point invests the comparatist with greater powers still for it suggests that she can just as well block the traffic of ideas as allow them safe passage, that she is authorized to rifle through texts in search of contraband content, 
vestigial attitudes of colonialism in modern European literature, for instance. The comparatist sits in judgment on the flow of ideas, with a more or less liberal, more or less laissez-faire sensibility. That the assumption of such a position is ethically as well as aesthetically problematic is not the least of its provocations. To study the history of the subject, however, and in particular, the close relationship in the twentieth century between the Jewish diaspora and the emerging academic discipline, is to realize that comparative literature is ultimately not so much about policing borders as crossing them. Comparatists choose to distance themselves from their own native cultures, to forgo their home literatures in favor of a willed homelessness, the better to gain purchase on texts and tropes that transcend any single idiom. They choose not to belong to any one particular tradition. Indeed, this unbelonging is arguably their defining characteristic. As intellectual émigrés, comparatists make links between cultures, but in doing so, they also, paradoxically, reinforce the distinctions between them. As such, the contrasts are as important as the comparisons, the disconnections as instructive as the connections. Comparative Literature in the Twenty-First Century but why, one might ask, do such metaphors matter? Why should I, why should you, care about how comparative literature views itself? The answer lies not in specialist skirmishes, but in common sense. For in the case of comparative literature, the metaphors it lives by are arguably as important as the insights it makes possible. Unlike other disciplines, Historically more secure in their intellectual and institutional status, comparative literature must constantly renew its sense of mission, constantly tell itself a new story about how and why literatures should be compared. To be sure, this is not to claim that other areas of the humanities are not equally restless and innovative in the ways that they view their work but they are not defined by the same unceasing sense of insecurity as an approach that by definition works in the gaps between disciplines. It is the continuous need to justify itself to itself that marks out comparative literature as uniquely beholden to changing intellectual fashions and thus to changing disciplinary metaphors. Comparative literature, in other words, must be understood comparatively, which is to say as historically contingent and context-specific. What we might provisionally take the adjective comparative to convey, then, is that the idea of comparison, in conjunction with the idea of literature, is as important as its practice. The animating impulse of comparative literature is not just the urge to take a broad perspective across differing forms and languages of literary expression. It is also the politically, ethically, and aesthetically charged notion that this is a worthwhile undertaking in the first place. Comparative literature cannot get by, in other words, without a pinch of pathos, since it is the utopian dream of being in no place. Utopos, and thus in every place, that drives it. More prosaically, comparative literature is also a question of themes and techniques. Often undertaken through the pursuit of overarching categories, such as sources, influences, motifs, genres and myths, comparative literature constructs its arguments through as wide a range as possible of examples and counterexamples. The only orthodoxy is diversity, the attempt to incorporate other perspectives than one's own. Importantly, this is true not only of the critical perspective of the reader, but also of the creative perspective of the writer. For comparative literature is a technique as well as a theory.
from Cervantes' claim that Don Quixote, the first modern novel, was written by an Arabic author, to the postmodern practice of constituting texts through references to other texts, modern literature could not exist without recourse to the comparative method. Comparison, that is to say, does not just occur after the event in the mind of the reader, but also already during the process of composition in the mind of the writer. What we have come to call intertextuality, T.S. Eliot incorporating Sanskrit into the wasteland, Shakespeare echoing Montaigne, is simply another form of comparison, whereby meaning emerges out of the interaction between texts. The relationship to intertextuality provides just one example of how comparative literature is defined by its strategic position between languages, literature, and culture. Literary theory, cultural studies, post-colonialism, world literature, translation studies, and reception studies. Comparative literature in the 21st century draws on all these disciplines and more. Out of these points of intersection emerge a number of recurring debates. The changing notions of high and popular culture, the shifting hierarchy of original and translated texts, concepts and criticisms of the canon, the status and composition of the text, debates that make comparative literature among the most dynamic of intellectual fields. Irrigated by any number of sources, it overflows with ideas as to how to conceive the role and purpose of the verbal arts in an ever more visual world. For this indeed is perhaps the principal function of comparative literature in the 21st century. Comparatively speaking, a disciplinary necessity, the subject has emerged in surprisingly good health from the recent squeeze on the humanities across much of the Western world since it remains one of the diminishingly few disciplines open to those interested in foreign literatures and broader perspectives. For ambitious readers with an appetite for ranging beyond their own native traditions, comparative literature is the natural home. Yet it is also the natural home for all those big questions about why literature and by extension culture still matters. To compare literatures and cultures must be to do more than merely accrue the sum of their parts. It must be to ponder and to protect international and interlinguistic cultural relations. The surest way of moving beyond a purely subjective response to the Rorschach test, in short, is to study the practice, the history, and the theory of comparative literature.